Good morning and welcome to today's program. Have you ever noticed how often people call someone they disagree with a Nazi? Or when they compare rules they find oppressive to the persecution of Jews during the Holocaust? Well, in today's program, we'll be looking at this phenomenon in depth. My name is Lisa Leff, and I'm the director of the Holocaust Museum's Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies. Today, I'll be turning the tables on our museum's regular Facebook Live host, historian Edna Friedberg, and inviting her to be our expert guest to answer these questions and more. Welcome, Edna. Good morning. It's fun to swap spots. It really is. So today, together, we'll be discussing the careless use of Holocaust comparisons and then we'll also share a testimony from Holocaust survivors in which they describe some of the most traumatic and horrific experiences of their lives. Through their words, they'll help us understand why wearing a mask is not like being forced to wear a Jewish star. During today's show, if you have questions for me or Edna, please send them in uh, by posting them in the comments section. We'll get to as many of them as we can during the course of today's live show. Okay, Edna, so let's begin with an example that came up just last week involving a well-known Holocaust symbol, and that's the Jewish star. So I saw this case play out in real time on Instagram and then um, in a ripple effect reaction on Twitter and elsewhere. Uh, what happened was a hat store in the city of Nashville, Tennessee, posted this photo uh, that it was selling yellow Star of David patches with the words not vaccinated on them. And these were clearly designed to be reminiscent of the ones that Germans forced Jews to wear during the Holocaust. Now, like most of you watching, I was disgusted to see this, but unfortunately I was also not at all surprised. It's become quite commonplace to make exploitative analogies like this one, uh, especially when someone feels oppressed by government policies or what feels to them like overreach by authorities. And in this case, thankfully, the backlash was swift. There was outrage on social media. People gathered to protest outside of the store's physical location. And the well-known hat brand Stetson publicly cut ties with the business. Uh, but what's interesting to me is what happened afterwards. In reaction, the store owner took down the post, but she remained defiant, um, basically still you know, sticking to her idea and apologizing though for what she called her insensitivity, but not for the sentiment behind it. But in my opinion, this is not a question of insensitivity. It's actually deliberately exploiting the murder of six million innocent human beings in order for this person and others who do that kind of thing to make a political point. Uh, sadly, as I mentioned, it's not an all an unusual thing. Invocations of the Star of David are no longer rare. We've seen them coming from influential voices in government and also from popular commercial brands. Um, an example we're looking at here comes from the fast fashion store Zara. Um, on the right is a shirt that they were selling and on the left is what it's designed uh, to look like, uh, like a striped uniform that Holocaust victims were forced to wear when imprisoned in Nazi concentration camps. Now, it kind of strains credulity to try to imagine who would want to wear this, um, why this would be a, a good marketing idea, but I guess, you know, it gives kind of an edginess, um, but also just shows this very cavalier and uh, insensitive, careless attitude toward what is actually real events and real pain that happened to real people. But and so that our viewers can have a clearer sense of where, uh, where you're coming from, can you tell us more about the origins of the Jewish star under the Nazis? So the Jewish star long, long predates the Nazis. As with so many of their policies and ideas, the Nazis were actually not, not that original. Uh, they exploited and built on much older traditions of European anti-Semitism, many of them based in church teachings. And they were opportunists who knew that hatred and suspicion of Jewish people was widespread uh, in Germany and in other countries in Europe. The history of forcing Jews to visibly identify themselves dates back more than 1200 years uh, before the Holocaust. Without going into too much detail, uh, it was done in Muslim caliphates in the 8th and 9th century. For example, Jews in Egypt had to wear bells on their clothing, like we might put on an animal's collar today so that you can hear him coming. 
And in Europe during the Middle Ages, uh, local kings, church officials as high as the Pope also uh, required Jews to wear visibly identifiable clothing or other humiliating markers. Um, not usually a Jewish star, but some were a circle on their clothes, some were shaped like the Ten Commandment tablets or even pointy hats. But the, the common uh, element throughout all of them is that Jews were labeled visibly uh, to seem like other outsiders and maybe um, not really human. In the Nazi era, the stars were first introduced in 1939 in German-occupied Poland. That may surprise some people because they feel like, oh, the Nazis came to power, all German Jews had to wear the star. But in fact, it actually started in Poland and then later uh, was extended to Germany and other occupied countries. And we need to recognize that these stars, like the ones we're looking at here, um, here in Yugoslavia, actually, and you'll notice that has a Z on it for the um, local word for Jew is Zhidov or Zhidovsky. Um, these were a prelude to a systematic plan to annihilate the Jews of Europe. The designs were different. Sometimes they were a patch. Uh, sometimes they were an armband, blue and white. We're seeing here one on the left that is actually sewn on like a button. It's made of the early plastic bakelite. Uh, the one on the right, the black star, is from Czechoslovakia. So it was different all over, but the purpose was really always the same. It was to make Jews identifiably trackable, uh, denounceable by others. And the penalty for not wearing it was severe. You had to wear it whatever the circumstances. So in fact, we're looking here at a photograph of a Jewish couple's wedding day in Poland in 1942. And it's jarring to see that even when he's a groom, uh, his Jewish star is there on his lapel. Presumably the bride is wearing one too, but it's it's blocked by her bouquet. So not, not a fashion statement, but actually a marking that sets Jews apart, right, for persecution. Yep, makes them a target. Yeah. So I want to acknowledge our viewers tuning in today. We've got people um, watching us from South Bend, Indiana, Centerville, Minnesota, Pompano Beach, Florida, and Nashville, Tennessee. We've also got international viewers with us today. Uh, people watching from Costa Rica, Greece, Guatemala, and Romania. Welcome, everyone. So back to talking about the star, Edna. Um, you know, there's a Holocaust survivor who volunteers at the museum named Nessie Godin. And I know she's spoken poignantly about what the star meant and how it changed her life. Edna, tell us about her experience. Very happy to talk about Nessie. I've had the pleasure of knowing her for many years, and we're looking here at a picture of Nessie as a young girl. Uh, she grew up in Lithuania and was only 13 years old when German troops occupied her town as part of their invasion of uh, Soviet territory in 1941. Um, Nessie is a force of nature. Um, anyone who's had the pleasure of hearing her speak, and we'll hear from her in just a minute, but in 1941, in the days and weeks immediately after the occupation, the Germans put into effect anti-Semitic laws, including one requiring all members of the Jewish community to wear a yellow Jewish Star of David. Let's watch Nessie, who went on to survive four labor camps and a death march, uh, describe to a group of students what it meant to her to be labeled with the star after the invasion and occupation of her hometown. In the next few weeks, all kinds of laws came out for Jewish people. For us, they were new laws, but those were old new laws that were created in Nuremberg. Jewish people were not allowed to walk on the street. Jewish people were not allowed to have stores. Jewish children were not allowed to go to school. Jewish women were not allowed to be pregnant. Jewish people had to wear a star of David in front and back of the garment. Now, why did we have to wear this star? For two reasons. One, a symbol of shame. The other, simple, to be recognized. Now, if they caught you without it, they killed you. So you figured, I'll wear that star and I won't die. You know, we did not know what is to come later. Yeah, clear as can be, right? So the analogy, the way it's being used, just does not work. But Edna, let's back up a minute. Um, are we saying no analogies at all? Are there times when analogies can in fact be useful? Absolutely. I mean, if we're not making connections to our lives today, to the world around us, what, what is the point of studying history? But it's when we use it as a blunt instrument 
or to sensationalize or to make a situation that is in no way comparable uh, seem more dramatic or serious. What I would ask that we do is that when we hear someone cre uh, comparing a current situation to the Holocaust, that we should ask ourselves, why? Why are they using this as their go-to analogy? Are they trying to be dramatic? Is it just the worst insult that they can think of? Is it clickbait online? Why do they need to use this particular history? The longer I study the Holocaust, and it's been, I don't know, 25 or 30 years that I've been engaged with this history, the more I realize how complicated it was and how it played out in a variety of different ways, depending on the moment in time, depending on the place. There's a quote that I keep next to my desk at the museum from a, a writer and a Holocaust survivor from the Netherlands named Abel Hertzberg. And he wrote, and I'm paraphrasing, that six million Jews were not murdered during the Holocaust. One Jew was murdered six million times. I think it's such a powerful statement because it reminds us that each of these deaths in another situation without this kind of big broad label on it would be a crime that merited its own investigation, its own understanding of what happened, its own uh, punishment for the perpetrators. And when we just kind of turn it into some kind of morality tale of good and evil, we lose all that specificity. So what we want is not to never draw connections, to, but to avoid careless or cavalier or overly simplified comparisons to the Holocaust. Yeah. So there are times, you know, when people have a deep knowledge of the Holocaust or they're going through Holocaust education or survivors themselves are inspired by what they know to draw those connections. And those are really powerful. You know, in fact, Holocaust survivors themselves are sometimes among the first to speak out when they see things around them that feel like echoes of their past. Um, our museum actually was, was founded by survivors who cared about the world around them. Let's take a look at this moment where Nobel laureate Elie Wiesel, who was one of the founders of our museum, um, spoke at the museum's dedication back in 1993, addressing then President Bill Clinton. We have learned that when people suffer, we cannot remain indifferent. And Mr. President, I cannot not tell you something. I have been in the former Yugoslavia last fall. I cannot sleep since of what I have seen. Something, as a Jew, I am saying that. We must do something to stop the bloodshed in that country. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to overstate the, the power of that moment, the conviction with which he speaks, because Ellie and survivors like him knew, knew in their core what it meant to be abandoned by the world uh, when targeted for death or destruction. So, you know, it's about being precise, about using it as a way to galvanize us to have an activist worldview, but not saying this is the same as this. This is, um, we really know. People need to learn more and be very specific. Yeah, and, and the way Elie Wiesel is using it there, he's not casually throwing, throwing this idea around. And that's really uh, what we're troubled by today. You know, to dig into this a little more, let's take a look at another analogy that is uh, perhaps the most casually thrown around. And that's the analogy to Nazis and especially to their leader, Adolf Hitler. Um, let's take a brief overview of who the Nazis actually were so that uh, we can illustrate just how misplaced some of these analogies are. So Nazis are not just uh, people who are somehow strict or harsh or mean. And I think that's uh, one of the dangerous kind of minimizations that has happened with the term. Uh, for people who don't know the origin of the word, even if they know it comes from the World War II era, it's actually an acronym for a political party in Germany, the National Socialist German Workers' Party, which was founded in that country in the immediate aftermath of World War II after its humiliating defeat in the war. The war and the punishing reparations that Germany was required to pay uh, devastated German economy. It destabilized its new, weak democratic government. And into this uh, vacuum, into this feeling of chaos, many radical groups arose, both on the left and in the case of the Nazis, on the right. 
Nazi party members had extreme and intense anti-Semitic views, and among those drew directly from World War I, a widely shared belief, a lie that Jews were somehow responsible for Germany's defeat and humiliation. Uh, we're seeing here a cartoon which illustrates what is known as the stab in the back myth, the idea that a Jewish figure there on the right had somehow betrayed or was a traitor to the brave German soldier. Uh, what's really ironic is that German Jews themselves actually served in their country's military in numbers much, much higher than their proportion to the population. So this myth is totally contrary to the actual facts. But it was appealing. It played on the feelings of insecurity and anxiety that were commonplace in the German uh, populace at the time. And although the Nazis began as a fringe movement, they grew into a mass movement. And once Adolf Hitler was appointed chancellor in January 1933, it became state policy. Uh, this state policy was reinforced by images like what we're seeing here, um, uh, a parade, a flag bearing parade at Nazi party day in Nuremberg. The Nazis were masters of pomp and circumstance, of ritual, of propaganda. And I wanna be clear, people may be surprised to know um, that they, they sold a lot of positive messages. It was not just about hatred or racism, but also the idea that they were going to redeem Germany. They were going to return it to former glory and to even greater heights. But once in power, the Nazis took control of every aspect of German life, whether it was the economy, education, to matters as intimate as sexual relations, um, the kind of books you could read, and within six months of their assumption of power, the Nazi became the only political party in Germany. And they didn't just take control by being attractive and having parades, right, Edna? They used violence as well. Yes, theirs was a profoundly violent movement, and also one that um, deliberately tore apart the fabric of society, encouraged people to denounce each other, to denounce even their family members, so it was an environment of fear, of terror, of suspicion. Street violence was common. Nazi stormtroopers often beat up uh, people in the streets, even killed their political opponents, not only Jews, but political opponents like communists, members of the Social Democratic Party. And they uh, gradually over the next few years uh, in invoked terror via law. They were not criminals, they were the law. And so their stranglehold over German Jewish li lives um, happened through legal restrictions, including forcing Jews from their homes, um, forcing them to give up their businesses, stealing their property. And uh, we can still hear the terror that the Nazis would instill in people, not just in Germany, but eventually in each country that they would uh, invade in Europe, uh, regardless of age. I'd like us actually to bring in another survivor voice, uh, this one from a man named Leo Malamed. Uh, Leo Malamed, uh, actually, here we're seeing him as a little boy walking down the street with his parents. He was born in the Polish city of Bialystok and was living there in 1941 when German troops entered his town and turned his life upside down. Many years later, Leo described what his face-to-face uh, -face encounter with Nazis felt like uh, when they came in and ransacked his family home. We were on the outskirts of the city um on the day in which the, the Nazis actually uh, came in. And it is also a sight that I will never forget because I was peeking through a keyhole that I had made in a window pane with a key so that I could see. And I saw the tanks, these giant mechanized uh, vehicles that I had never seen, not in pictures, and not ever even imagined that what they were coming towards the building. Eventually, they came to search for my father. They wore their boots. When you're a seven-year-old, you only see a person up to their knees, usually. But to me, at that moment in time, having never seen soldiers, nor having them come into a house, disrupt our life, open drawers, shout at my mother, bang on the doors and look through every nook and cranny to see if they could find my father was something that I personally will never forget. I remember the, the tears welling in my mother's eyes as she tried to respond to their harsh German as best as she could. 
Yeah, listening to Leo, it, you really, it's a really stark case of what an actual Nazi did, right? This was in the context of war, violence, destruction, and the effect that that had on a young boy. This is really different than the casual use of the word Nazi to mean someone very strict. Um, and I want to bring in now, though, a comment from one of our viewers, um, Jack Rickson from Scottsdale, Arizona. I always thought of the physical and emotional abuse that men and women endured and didn't think of attacks on children like Leo. As obvious as that would be, my mind wouldn't go there until now. My heart breaks for every victim of the Shoah. That's a really um, poignant and on point comment, especially when you remember that basically all Holocaust survivors who still remain alive today were young during the time of the war. If they were not kids, they were at the oldest teenagers. And so these are really uh, formative traumatic events that happened to them and uh, continue to, to shape their worldview. Absolutely. So today though, you know, the term Nazi is used so often um, that it's become almost a shorthand um, or, you know, you, we use it as like the ultimate insult. Can you show us some recent examples of that, Edna? Absolutely. So it does mean sort of the embodiment of evil, the most extreme takedown that a person can think of. Uh, we often see it directed against political figures in particular. American presidents have been and continue to be compared to Hitler as a mean to criticize their administration's policies. And this happens regardless of political party. We're seeing here an example on the left in which President Barack Obama uh, was defaced with an easily recognizable Hitler style mustache. Uh, and then on the right, an image from a few years later of President Donald Trump falsely depicted in a Gestapo or SS uniform. Uh, again, trying to galvanize or stir up political opponents to think that whoever this president is, he's the embodiment of evil and somehow threatening. And something we should rise up against, right? It's trying to galvanize us to do something, you know, almost violent. Yeah, it's a, it's a really uh, radical and I think kind of cheap um, emotional ploy. Yeah. So, you know, these two examples are from recent years, um, and that leads to my next question, right? These comparisons aren't new, but they do seem to be on the rise. Can you kind of characterize or typologize what we're seeing today? What are the ways that they are used? So one of the reasons that Holocaust comparisons have been around so long and that people perceive them as so effective is that actually they, they kind of reflect um, the, the, fract the fractured nature of American society today and political polarization because they hearken back to an era of World War II when the country at least seemed and felt much more unified, that the enemy was clear and it was outside of our country as opposed to in. So it's inverting this sense of unity in a way that is divisive. The other part that feels really new and very, very troubling is that they have become more commonplace and frequent at the same moment over the last few years and in recent weeks, in fact, when we have seen dramatic increases in anti-Semitic violence and also acts of uh, vandalism or destruction at Jewish businesses, not businesses, but Jewish synagogues, schools, places like that. That is really disturbing. The ways that they are used, though, I can think of a few different ways to categorize them. One is sort of the verbal equivalent of throwing a bomb or a grenade. It's just sort of a way to abruptly end an argument as a last resort. Like, I can't even reason with you because you're a Nazi. Like it just shuts down or takes down the level of discourse so that there's no possibility of meaningful conversation. The second is sort of like what we just saw with the presidential examples, but can be in a much more local or issue specific um, argument as well to mobilize people against an enemy or to uh, cast the, the opponent or the cause as something so threatening that you should want to um, rise up or gather together in order to oppose it. And then there are also ways that people do it, I think, with some good, good intentions, but not necessarily aware of the slippery slope of their um, comparisons. Um, ways that they feel like, I know about this history, I want to make people care about it, but without thinking about the fact, for example, that it might be very, very hurtful. 
Um, but there are, of course, and I think we'll talk about this more in a minute, some productive reasons to recognize parallels, which is different from comparisons or saying this is equivalent to this. And that's why our museum exists. That's why I'm in this field while you're in this field is to educate about the history and the complex factors that led to it. Our museum teaches that the Holocaust was not inevitable. There are many steps and that there were a lot of ways that human beings had discretion or agency to change the course of events, even if it just was about saving one life. Local officials in different places could decide how strictly to enforce a policy or not, whether to look the other way. A neighbor could provide bread to someone who was being deliberately starved or offer a safe haven to someone in need of a place to hide. So what I'm really cautioning against is that we don't want to use the Holocaust as a blunt instrument. The idea that there are just Nazis, <clears throat> excuse me, um, but that it's important to be really educated about it and to understand really the specifics of what we're talking about. Let me just um, push you a moment because we have a terrific audience question that can help us make this distinction even more. A viewer named Melinda has written in asking, um, asking us about this and she says, people use the ter term Nazi not to diminish the suffering of the Holocaust, but to keep it at the forefront of our minds that evil is real and dehumanization always starts with the little things. So I appreciate that comment, Melinda. And I would just caution you that there is a meaningful distinction to be made, whatever you know our good intentions are, between using the exact same terms as opposed to kind of using knowing about the history to motivate us to act. When we say that this is equivalent to this, we both kind of belittle and diminish or dismiss the actual pain and suffering and human toll of the Holocaust, but we also lose the ability to talk in productive specifics about the cause that we care about. And as I said, it can be on the left or the right, whether it's about gun rights or pro-life ideas, or whether it's about animal rights or protecting immigrants or people speak, seeking asylum. Why do we need to invoke this other period of time? Isn't what's happening today or whatever it is, the issue that we care about, um, powerful enough on its own without having to bring in um, this time and place that is so, so different? I think we come further away from productive conversation and meaningful policy change. Yeah, and you know, sort of echoing what you've just said, Edna, we've had another comment from Elena from Norfolk, Virginia, who wrote that many of the survivors who volunteer for the USHMM, our museum, have spoken out against using Holocaust metaphors for political purposes. And I think that's some of what you're saying, right? It's one thing to be educated and to act on the basis of what you've learned. And it's another thing to be kind of flip or even instrumentalizing or using the Holocaust for really other ends. It actually reminds me of another word that uh, really kind of gets my goat. And I don't want to come across just as scoldy or uptight, but I spent a lot of time thinking about the nuances of language here. I get very uncomfortable when, uncomfortable when people talk about uh, the people who died during the Holocaust as martyrs, because martyrdom uh, by definition implies that a person had a choice that they were you know, falling on their sword for a principle. And Jews were considered by the Nazis to be inherently biologically inferior or dangerous. It wasn't about belief. You could have been an atheist, and many were, um, and still be killed. And so I think we just wanna be careful not to try to attribute meaning or deep lessons to what in fact were, were pointless criminal murders in a scale of millions and millions people of people. They didn't die in order for us to uh, win political points or an argument today. Yes. I wanna take a moment to welcome Paula and her seventh and eighth grade classes from New Jersey. And also thanks to our viewers who are tuning in from the Museum of the Holocaust in Guatemala. You know, indeed this is a global conversation and it's a global phenomenon that we're talking about. Um, I think to dig in, to our conversation a little more, it might be good to go back to another example of an analogy that's often misused, and that's the analogy to concentration camps. So I feel like in recent years, particularly, we have seen people comparing almost anything that they consider arduous or restrictive to a concentration camp, 
We're seeing here an example from this year of a cartoon uh, that kind of juxtaposes two different iconic Holocaust images. One, the train tracks leading into the killing center at Auschwitz, and um, then a version of uh, a gate that appears also at Auschwitz. Uh, the original had um, a euphemism, a misleading line on it in German, roughly translated as work makes you free. And here instead it says, vaccines are safe, a path to freedom. Uh, this cartoon was distributed in the United Kingdom by those who believe that scientists' assurances of the safety of COVID vaccines is also misleading um, and would like us to think that it's just like um, the deception that was happening to prisoners at Auschwitz. And again, I want to re return us to the kind of uh, exercise that we can do for ourselves. You have to wonder why. Why is it specifically the Holocaust here? Why do they feel the need to do this? And what is the actual purpose behind the message? Uh, and to remind ourselves of the reality of concentration camps. For many, they were a death sentence. They were places where families were torn apart, where people were deliberately starved, where disease ran rampant. And it's in no way comparable. Uh, and it's in fact really offensive uh, to the, those who survived and to the memory of those who died there. Yeah, can you tell us even more about those experiences of people who were confined in the Nazi concentration camps? So the term concentration camp refers uh, to a large prison complex in which people are confined without legal process. And concentration camps predated World War II um, but today the term is most closely understood and clearly in um, widespread circulation because of its association with the Holocaust. And I, speaking personally, have a really hard time believing when people defensively claim, oh, I I'm not invoking the Holocaust. It's, you know, there, this term was around long before. I don't think many people have heard of, for example, concentration camps in the Boer War in South Africa in the early 1900s. Uh, People use this term because it's well known, because of the emotion it invokes related to the Holocaust. Actual concentration camps, as I mentioned, were places of intense suffering and death. Uh, not only the starvation and disease, the enslavement of people in service of Germany's war efforts, uh, indiscriminate beatings, exposure to extreme cold and heat, and many, many hundreds of thousands of people, not just Jews, were imprisoned there, political opponents, gay men, Christian Poles, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses who would not swear allegiance to Hitler. And the Nazi camp system also held prisoner, prisoners of war. And uh, one more point I'd like to make is that even the idea that there's just this one term, concentration camp, uh, kind of papers over a range of differences, that there were many, many different types of camps created for different purposes. Forced labor camps, way stations that were known as transit camps, and then what we may think of the most, camps that were designed specifically as killing centers, uh, death factories in, you know, intended and deliberately created to commit murder on an industrial scale. What we are seeing here is historical film footage of a deportation of Jews marked with one of the identifying armbands that we described uh, at the beginning of the show. Um, and as you can see, they are being loaded into not passenger cars, but cargo or uh, cattle cars uh, to be sent to places unknown. And it's a reminder, we see their whole family units, you know, parents holding hands with their kids. This happened to people, not victims, but to human beings who had names and personalities and lives and hopes and dreams. Um, and uh, I think we should hear actually again from another Holocaust survivor describing her personal uh, lived experience of these camps. Um, here we see a photo of a young woman named Anna Gross um, describing the experience she had after four days packed into one of these rail cars of arriving at what she would later learn was Auschwitz, along with her five sisters, her little niece, and her mother. Let's hear from I was so dizzy that I couldn't know where, where to go. They started to say, woman, children in one side, in the other side the man. All of a sudden I found myself with my three sisters in one side and my mother and my older sister with the baby, three-year-old baby, and my youngest sister, 14 years old, in, in another side. And my mother started 
say, where do you take my daughters? But nobody answered that. We never saw them again. The first question was, where are our parents? Where are the rest of the people? And then she said, you crazy, stupid people what you are. You don't know what happened to them? Look up there in the smoke. There are your parents. And um, the smoke she was referring to was from the crematoria at the camp. Um, smoke from the bodies of her parents and other people uh, being burned after being killed in the gas chambers. I understand that Julia, who is Anna's granddaughter, is actually watching us today. Um, Anna taught so much to people at our museum by sharing her story. Um, she died last year. We miss her terribly, and I'm sure you do too. We're so glad you're watching, Julia. Yeah, Julia, may your grandmother's memory be for a blessing. And also a reminder for us not to take for granted um, the, the strength and the selflessness that it takes for survivors to talk about their history. These are not easy memories to relive again and again, especially in a room full of strangers. And we owe a debt of gratitude to, to your grandma and to uh, her peers. Um, as long as I have the floor, I guess I'm too used to being host, so I, I can't help it. Lisa, I'd like to ask you a question um, because you are the director of the center within our museum that is dedicated to scholarly work. How do scholars draw the line? Because it's a tricky line between responsible analysis or inquiry and what we would call the more reckless use of Holocaust imagery or comparisons. Where is that uh, divider? Edna, I'm sure you remember, you know, a couple of years ago, the museum issued a statement along these very lines, cautioning against the reckless use of Holocaust comparisons. And at that time, scholars were extremely alarmed and many reached out to us thinking that we meant that they should never draw any connections at all uh, you know between the past and other events or even the past and the present that we they thought we were saying that no connection should ever be made to this history so i do want to take a moment to make a more clear distinction right what we're talking about today really is careless analogies as they appear on social media or in our public life. These are one-sided, they're often politicized, and they're weak analogies. They're almost always inaccurate analogies. This is not what scholars are doing, and it's not what teachers are doing in the classroom or anyone who's taking a deep dive into Holocaust education. You know, scholars work by analogy, right? Historians aren't just um, uncovering facts about the past, they're trying to understand the past. And in order to do that, they look for similarities and they also look for differences, right? That's what it means to work by analogies. They're looking for real connections between events as well as patterns. When they compare carefully, that's when we can get to those questions that are so important to scholars, like why the Holocaust happened, how it happened, and it's only through that kind of work that we get quality Holocaust education. Um, but that's a careful process. And clearly in the ways that people talk about the Holocaust today, those scholars are in the minority. What we're seeing more often is one-sided or tendentious comparisons. And I'd like to move now to talking with you, Edna, about what exactly the potential harm might be from making those kinds of comparisons. Okay. Um, I think we have a viewer question actually that kind of gets to that um, from someone named Michelle. Do you see that there? Oh yeah. Is there a way to respond to these comparisons? Yeah, really important for, uh, for all of us to think about what do you do when you hear this? So I'd love to take that if I could. I think Please. the first important thing is, what's the context where you're hearing this? Is this in real life with a person with whom you have an actual relationship? You know, Is it your neighbor in your dorm? Is it your uncle? Is it 
someone who you are encountering in an actual conversation where there's a chance to engage and ask that kind of question to try to get at their underlying motivations. Why are you bringing this up? What is it? What do you see, as Lisa suggested, that is similar? What do you see that is different? Help them to kind of get beyond um, the surface level, um, superficial co comparison and look at something that is more complex. What I would caution you against though, is taking the bait from trolls online, from being, let's say, in Facebook comments and having someone who brings it up really, as I said, just to throw a grenade, just to kind of get someone on the defensive and who isn't actually doing it from a place of good intention. Also to help people and remind people if it is that in-person or real life um, human relationship that you have with someone who might be receptive, to think about the actual history, the actual pain or trauma that lies underneath this term that they are throwing around so casually. We don't want to get uh, numb to the real meaning of this history. And it's something that my colleagues and I think about a lot. If you're working with this material day in and day out, you actually need to you know, not feel devastated by it all the time or you can't go to work. But there has to be a way that you don't lose sight of what it actually means and what it meant and what it did to families and to communities. And so I think by um, kind of monitoring ourselves against using words in a way that is too familiar too intimate based on what we actually know, we can be cautious. Yeah. And if we're not cautious, um, you know, let's get back to this question about why is this dangerous? You know, what do you see as the potential harm here? So I think these kind of comparisons, these blunt instrument analogies, as I think of them, have the potential to be dangerous on two levels. One is some of what we've talked about today, the micro level the way that doing so hurts and disrespects or diminishes the personal histories of the Holocaust, the one that exploits uh, the memory of those who died and that is disrespectful of the pain and scars of people who have survived, even if they aren't with us anymore. People like my own father, like my grandparents, uh, for whom it wasn't the Holocaust, it was the murder of their siblings or aunts and uncles or grandparents. Um, so that's the micro level, but the macro level and the one that I think should concern all of us, whether or not we have any personal connection to this history, whether or not we are Jewish, is that it really degrades us as a society. I think it's part of an overall cheapening that I see in American society that many of us observe with alarm where we are numb and callous to the pain of others and where we also don't necessarily take seriously uh, the warnings to which we are alerted uh, by studying this history, by how quickly a society devolved into murdering its own citizens. The Holocaust really is the world's best documented crime. We have tens of thousands of documents, of artifacts, of photographs, many of them created by the perpetrators themselves that help us to study this event in a way that very few uh, historical cataclysms can be studied. And when we take these analogies, we lose all that specificity, we lose all of that nuance. Just looking at the testimonies that we heard today from survivors, it's a reminder that the Holocaust did not unfold in uniform ways. We heard from survivors today from Lithuania, from Poland, from Romania. Every context, every place had its own specific variables and we need to do justice to that. Um, my last couple of points. After the war, an entire field of human rights and international law was created. Uh, in order to recognize these warning signs. And when we just kind of act as though there's a toggle, an on and off switch between good and evil, we don't have the ability to um, monitor, to enforce, um, and to try to create the kind of society we want. We're living in a moment, in closing, where there's an assault on facts and truth. And I think part of the danger has to do with where we see these Holocaust analogies, often online. Um, by their very nature, social media and memes are really, really poorly suited to any kind of complex ideas. And when we find ourselves grasping for simple answers to complex problems, um, we, we should get a little bit nervous. We need to have more patience. We need to roll up our sleeves and do the hard work 
of working on the thorny problems that bother us, the root causes of injustice, and also engaging with people with whom we disagree, not just calling them a Nazi and shutting it down, but um, really, really, you know, trying to get our communal fabric stronger. And in a way, you know, conversations like this are a good starting point, right? So when it's not a troll on social media, but it's the friend that you're just making in the dorm who casually tosses this around to actually sit down and engage and talk about what, you know, know that teacher isn't a Nazi because they expect you to turn in assignments on time. Here's what the Nazis are. And really um, using that as a as a moment to, to go deeper, I think that's something that our viewers um, can take away from this program uh, that's important to do. Agree, and especially we're in a moment where we have fewer and fewer eyewitnesses to this history every day. And so the, the burden of, of truth and historical memory is really shifting to those of us who've only learned about it secondhand or third hand. And we need to take that seriously and treat it with respect and with um, loving care. Yeah. Um, I want to read a final comment from our viewer, Jen. She says, I've never thought about the inappropriateness of the analogy before. I'm sure that I'm guilty of having used it. Thank you for educating us today. And, and I would say the same is true for me. Thank you for educating me today and for this conversation. Um, you know, I especially appreciated thinking about what we have to lose when we're not careful. For me, it was also moving today to see all those, um, uh, all that testimony from survivors themselves when they describe their personal experiences with some of these symbols and making that connection more directly. And I think anyone who comes to our museum or visits our resources online, I hope that from those, uh, all of you can make deep, ask deeper questions and think more critically using the past as a way to think about our present. Let's close with these words from Auschwitz survivor, Cecily Klein Pollock. If anybody comes to the museum and will see the momentous that we left behind, whether it's a little shoe, whether it's a letter, whether it's a torn prayer book. Remember, these are our precious, precious valuables, and remember them when we are gone. And remember the agony of the survivors that had to live with these memories and could never touch them, could never have them back. And we hope that future generations will never know of our pain and that everybody will stand up to any form of persecution. So with those words, let's conclude today's program. I'd like to uh, thank you again, Edna, and thank our viewers and invite all of you to come back in two weeks and join us for our next program. That will be called Diplomats Who Risked It All to Save Lives. And it will air on Friday, June 18th at 9.30 a.m. We'll be commemorating World Refugee Day by honoring a few diplomats who took great risks to offer refuge and save the lives of European Jews and other victims of Nazi persecution. Thank you again for joining us and be well.